Welcome to the next video, Principles of Biomarker Testing, Part 2, The Liquid Biopsy, where we'll be talking about assessing DNA sequencing from the blood using circulating tumor DNA. In the previous video, Part 1, we talked about tissue-based biomarker testing. We talked about the various sources of biopsy from an endoscopy or core biopsies from an ultrasound or CT-guided imaging perspective and of course from surgical resections and how that tissue is processed and how extra slides cut from that original biopsy can be used for biomarker testing in the tissue, looking at protein by immunostochemistry or IHC and genetic change like fish copy number of gene amplified uh, tumors like HER2. In addition to those low throughput tests, we can get DNA from that same biopsy sample and do next generation sequencing to look at a panel of oncogenes and assess further uh, potential therapeutic options. We talked about how this takes a little bit longer in terms of turnaround time than the other low throughput immunostochemistry and fish assays. We talked about the gene sequencing panels that are doing next generation sequencing and that an advantage is that they can look at numerous genes simultaneously looking at all four uh, main genetic alterations which is an advantage, and we showed some examples of that. One of the examples we showed was the Foundation 1 test, which is a large oncogene panel. And one of the things I didn't mention is that this typically takes significant amount of tissue in order to get a successful gene sequencing result. So what I didn't mention is that there are other forms of obtaining tissue uh, listed on this slide. One is called a fine needle aspiration or FNA, where rather than a core biopsy, one takes just a needle and basically pulls back and sucks and gets um, some cells from the area. A, a common area to try and uh, obtain a, such a biopsy is a lymph node in the neck called a cervical lymph node, uh, a fine needle aspiration. So from this aspiration, the pathologist can certainly determine if there are cancer cells there. Um, for example, as a staging tool to see if it has spread to what would be referred to as a stage four metastatic lymph node. The problem is, is that there would be so few cells there that there wouldn't be enough DNA to provide for next generation sequencing. Similarly, another form of aspiration is obtained via endoscopic ultrasound or endoscopic bronchial ultrasound, where in the esophagus or the bronchial or trachea, respectively, the endoscopist can go in and then stick a needle through the wall of the esophagus or the, the bronchioles at, into lymph nodes that are suspicious or where a sample wants to be obtained from and look at this under the microscope. And so similar to an FNA externally, a pathologist can certainly look and see if there are cancer cells there, there would often not be enough sample there uh, to get enough DNA to do next generation sequencing. Similarly, we talked about peritoneal disease in gastroesophageal cancer, which is very common. And we talked about this in the diagnosis video and also how to stage videos where a laparoscopy would be performed to assess for obvious disease or uh, small amounts of disease through surgical biopsy, where this would be sent to the pathologist. Again, the pathologist would be able to look at this and identify cells that are abnormal and indicate that there is or is not cancer there. It is very common in this situation where the pathologist can say, yes, there are cancer cells there, but there are very few. And usually it's in a bed of dense stromal elements, fibers, but very few cancer cells. So this would be referred to as low cancer cellularity or viability. So again, a diagnosis can be made, a staging a procedure can be done, but there's often not enough DNA there to be able to send for next generation sequencing. And then finally, there's the situation we also talked about in uh, how to diagnose uh, the cancer where it's very common for these cancers to spread to the pleural cavity or the abdominal cavity, peritoneal cavity. So a pleural effusion or ascites in the abdominal cavity. And from these fluid collections, 
we can stick a needle into there from the outside and aspirate all of that fluid out. One, just for palliative reasons to help with breathing, for example, or abdominal discomfort from the ascites. But in addition to that, that fluid can be sent to the pathologist or cytologist and looked under the microscope. And so if there are cancer cells, which is very common in this situation, they would identify these cancer cells. But again, similar to all these other scenarios, there's often not enough DNA from these very few cells to then go on and proceed to do next generation sequencing. So in all of these examples, and in addition, obviously, to where there originally was enough sample from a biopsy, from a traditional endoscopy biopsy or from a core biopsy, eventually, if you do enough slices of this for diagnostic purposes and for biomarker testing and other reasons, then this block will eventually be exhausted. It's not an infinite source. And so for any of these reasons, where there's low tumor viability, cellularity, and or the block is exhausted, to try and then do biomarker testing with gene sequencing, it's not feasible or possible. So then they enter the so-called liquid biopsy and its utility. So a liquid biopsy, other, otherwise known as a blood draw, um, is basically looking and leveraging the understanding that cancer cells throughout one's body can release their DNA into the bloodstream. And so we can do a blood draw and obtain this and try and do gene sequencing from that cell-free DNA. So a few things to mention is that um, we're talking about cells that have ruptured and the inner contents are floating around free, cell-free DNA or CFDNA. This is not referring to circulating tumor cells or CTCs, which is a full tumor cell that breaks off and starts floating around in the blood. We can identify those as well in the blood. They're usually at much, much lower concentrations and levels and their, their utility therefore are, are less than what has already been validated looking at CTDNA, which is more abundant and, and more readily available. So another thing to mention is that the half-life of this DNA in the blood is only on the order of hours. And so when you do a blood draw, it's really representing what's going on in the cancer at that moment, as opposed to a biopsy, which I told I we went through in the previous video that is processed and fixed in time whenever that biopsy was taken, represents whenever that biopsy or surgery was taken. And so often a surgery could have been done years before, and now you're trying to go back to that sample and do biomarker testing. And it's re reflecting what happened in the tumor at that time. And things can change as we'll talk about in the next video, tumor heterogeneity. And so it may be an outdated look at what's going on as opposed to a blood draw, which really represents what's going on at right around the time of that blood draw. So the next thing to understand is that we all sitting here have normal cell-free DNA floating around in our blood. That is coming from mostly our white blood cells, which are circulating around in our peripheral blood. And occasionally those white blood cells rupture. And so you get normal cell-free DNA in the peripheral blood. And so in a patient that has cancer, they have all their normal cell-free DNA floating around, but also cancer cells will be releasing their DNA into the peripheral blood as well, and it will mix together. And so the whole cell-free DNA component is composed of the normal cell-free DNA from the white blood cells, plus the amount of cell circulating tumor DNA that's there as well. And so this is what, when we get to talking about mutation allele frequency or MAF, or also known as variant allele frequency is telling us what is the percentage amongst all the DNA that's free floating around in the blood is related to the tumor as compared to the normal DNA? And so, you know, it's basically just the amount of circulating tumor DNA over the full component of what's there. And it is not uncommon in the newly diagnosed setting, I'll, I'll show you, that most patients will have identifiable circulating tumor DNA. And for the most part, it ranges about one to 10% of all the cell-free DNA floating in the blood. When we get to looking perioperatively as opposed to stage four, that this will be a much lower percentage, usually less than 
especially post-surgery, right after surgery. And so we'll talk about what this means in terms of di uh, in terms of developing tests uh, designed to identify the circulating tumor DNA in these two very different scenarios. So a way to look at it is of all the DNA present in two different examples, the blue represents all the normal DNA and the red represents the so-called needle in the haystack, very few molecules of circulating tumor DNA there compared to all that normal DNA. And in another example, a patient who has maybe more, more tumor burden, as I'll show you, will tend to have a little bit higher circulating tumor DNA proportion at, in the whole component of cell-free DNA. Another way to think of it is if this is your blood vessel, you would have all kinds of molecules or fragments of cell-free DNA that's normal from normal cells or germline normal DNA. And every now and then you'll have a spattering of a circulating tumor DNA component. And um, something that we'll get to when we talk about minimal residual disease testing in the perioperative setting is that something we can leverage is that we know that fragment lengths of DNA from normal cells tends to be a little bit longer than the fragment length of circulating tumor DNA. And so we can help to use that to differentiate and identify those abnormal circulating tumor DNA molecules. And this is a, something called fragmentomics. The fragment lengths are important to understand. So from that, we, we do know that there are assays designed specifically for the stage four setting as compared to the perioperative or localized setting as compared to before there is a known cancer and looking to screen for, for the population to see uh, and identify cancers. And so um, the validation of the different tests designed in each of these scenarios is really because it was first assessed and, and looked at in the stage four setting. There's much more validation and routine clinical use in the stage four setting and um, lesser degree in the perioperative setting and even less degree in the screening setting, as I'll show you. So where does this DNA come from, from the tumor? Again, um, most of it comes from cell death as the cancer is dividing and turning over and proliferating. Some of the cells die. And so some of that DNA is released into the peripheral blood. And so the amount of circulating tumor DNA, the concentration or the allele frequency, is really just an equation of how much is going in and how much is going out, uh, the rate at which that's happening. And that will leave you with how much circulating tumor DNA is in the peripheral blood. I'm going to show you that there are some key principles to understand that, that affect the amount of circulating tumor DNA. One is how fast the cancer is growing and turning over. I just told you that the DNA comes from cells dying and proliferating. So if you have a cancer that's more aggressive and proliferating faster, then it will be releasing and shedding DNA into the peripheral blood more. I will also show you that the more cancer sites, the bigger the cancer sites, the more cancer cells, the more likely they'll be shedding at a higher rate. And therefore you'll be able to detect a higher concentration of DNA, all else equal. I'm going to show you the location of where the cancer masses are is going to be important. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the peritoneal cavity notably doesn't shed as well into the peripheral blood. And so you can have cancer cells there, but it's not penetrating and getting into the peripheral blood. And so you won't see it as well. It will have a lower concentration, all else equal. And then finally, some patients just degrade the DNA at a faster rate than others if everything else was the same. If a patient has a high degradation rate of the DNA, it's getting degraded faster and removed, then they're going to have a lower concentration of DNA. So all of these factors are taken into account when looking at a result from a blood draw looking at circulating tumor DNA concentration. I'm going to also show you that the timing of when the blood draw is very, very important as it pertains to around what therapies are being done and I'll show you that in some figures. So from this understanding then, if you find the circulating tumor DNA in the blood and you're seeing a specific genetic mutation or gene amplification, then it's there. There's a good positive predictive value. There's a relatively very low false positive rate. On the other hand, 
if you do not see any circulating tumor DNA in the blood, it's not a great negative predictive value because you could have a cancer that's slow growing and or very low burden of cancer and or cancer only in the peritoneal cavity, for example, and or a high degrader of circulating tumor DNA compared to others. And so in any of those situations, you would have a known cancer there, but you may not see the circulating tumor DNA. So that could be a false negative in other words. So if it's positive, even at a low level, a common question is, is this important? My allele frequency is 0.08%. Is that important? It sounds so low. But if you recall that we're looking amongst all the, the cell-free DNA molecules, most of which are normal from our white blood cells, even to see a little bit of circulating tumor DNA there, it's telling you that that DNA is present and whatever mutation is being read, it's a real mutation that's there. What you have to be careful about though, is that if you don't see a specific mutation or gene alteration you're looking for, it doesn't mean it's not truly there in the tissue. It's just that you can't find it yet in the blood. And so what we're sort of getting at, and I was alluding to, is that the CT DNA concentration increases as you increase the amount of cancer burden. And as a surrogate of that, the stage of the cancer. So the usually the higher the stage, the more cancer burden you have. And so therefore you're going to have just that baseline when you're diagnosed a higher amount of DNA in a higher stage. And so in each of these situations, late stage, early stage, and even in screening situations, different assays are applicable because you'll have different amounts of circulating tumor DNA that you're going for. But even in the stage four setting, I've shown you that you're contending with this huge amount of normal cell-free DNA in the peripheral blood that you're trying to find needles in the haystack. So you still need a high sensitivity circulating tumor DNA assay. But of course, it will be higher sensitivity assays that are being designed in that perioperative setting where your burden of disease is lower. And after surgery, certainly after you remove the tumor that's known to be there, you will, you will have very little amount of circulating tumor DNA there if there is still cancer present microscopically. And so, certainly in the setting of where you're screening and you're looking for really early setting disease, you really need to have high, high sensitivity circulating tumor DNA assays. So first, just to show you um, some of the variables that change the circulating tumor DNA concentration, one is the tumor type. And this study showed that across different tumor types, you can have different levels of circulating tumor DNA. And for gastroesophageal cancer, I mentioned for the most part in the stage four setting, you know, the, the most patients will have identifiable circulating tumor DNA, even with stage four high sensitivity assays compared to higher sensitivity assays in the perioperative setting. And again, showing here that the higher the stage, generally the higher the concentration of circulating tumor DNA. So more patients will have an identifiable circulating tumor DNA mutation or alteration. We showed this specifically for gastroesophageal cancer, where we looked at the number of metastatic sites, the higher had a higher um, identifiable circulating tumor DNA content. Similarly, in patients in the stage four setting who had surgery of their primary tumor but still had known metastatic sites, had an overall lower amount of circulating tumor DNA compared to those who had stage four disease but an intact primary tumor, which makes sense because there's more cancer cells and there's more DNA being shed into peripheral blood. Similarly, the location of where the cancer is spread to is important where liver and lung metastases tend to have a really higher amount of circulating tumor DNA compared to other sites, for example, peritoneal cavity. And that's shown isolated here that peritoneal only disease. So stage four cancers that are only spread to the peritoneal cavity and nowhere else tend to have much lower circulating tumor DNA values compared to those that have other metastatic sites. And in many or most cases, it's just not detectable at all, even though you know it's there. 
So with these clinical factors affecting the concentration of circulating tumor DNA or the amount of DNA being shed into the peripheral blood, the higher the stage, the higher the disease burden, the higher the proliferation rate and death rate, and the tumor type, of course, gastroesophageal tends to be a higher amount of shedder, except for those diffuse type signet ring tumors that go to the peritoneal cavity only, they tend to be really low shedders. And so this needs to be in, taken into account when we're looking at the result, both in the curative setting where a patient just had surgery and their cancer, their known cancer has been removed. Any preoperative circulating tumor DNA that was identified usually drops precipitously because you've removed the cancer. Um, and um, in the stage four setting, we'll, as we'll show you, that after, if you were to check daily uh, during treatment from the day one of treatment and, and onward, you would actually see a spike in the DNA. It would go up initially because you're killing more cancer cells with the treatment. And so you see more DNA, but then very quickly after a few days after it will drop precipitously, especially if the treatment's working in responders. And so the timing of when you do the blood draws important. And in the setting of where you've been on a therapy for a long time and you have stable disease, doing a blood draw at that point where it would usually lead to low or no circulating tumor DNA because the cancer is controlled and it's not growing and it's not shedding a lot of DNA. So for stage four disease, if the intention of your, your blood draw circulating tumor DNA next generation sequencing test is to try and identify genetic events to target based on therapies, the ideal time to draw the blood would be before you start any therapy or at the time that any given therapy stops working because that's going to be the opportune time to, to see when there's more circulating tumor DNA in the blood and you can actually see it there. And I'll show you that on a figure, which is very descriptive. On the other hand, you can do in between, um, like when there's stable disease, to, to monitor the disease status and, and to check on whether the therapy seems to be working. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So in the stage four setting specifically, um, there are a number of um, available DNA oncopanel tests out there. This is an example of the GARDEN360 test, which was the first test available on the market now almost 10 years ago. And in contrast to the tissue-based uh, panels where I showed you there on the order of 400, 500 genes in, in the list, this panel will, is a, a gene panel from the blood is usually smaller. In this case, it's a 74 gene panel. And I'll show you in a moment why that is, is because again, we're looking for needles in the haystack. And so we don't want to spread too thin and look at too many genes because then we can't detect them at low levels. And so we have to sort of parse down and pick the, the, the top genes to really go for. And so the, the panel narrows in order to do that. And so that said, the, the most important genes that, that we're interested in, I've highlighted a few of them here, the gene amplifications, for example, of HER2, EGFR, FGFR2, and MET, which again, if you recall in the targeted therapy video, can amount to 30 to 40% of all the gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas, they're there, of course. And so in addition to that, um, these tests can also identify whether you have a microsatellite instability, high tumor, and they can also tell you the tumor mutation burden. And so an example of uh, a test is shown here on the right, this is the front page of a GARDEN360 report, where an advantage of these tests also is that you can do them serially through the blood with minimal invasion compared to a repeat biopsy. And so this is an example of multiple different time points for and showing the different mutation allele frequency at every time point. And so this at baseline newly diagnosed stage four disease, you can see that this patient at 27.2% of all the DNA in their blood was tumor related. And then after a few months of therapy, had a precipitous drop to 0.2%. And then after some more therapy was non-detectable ND. And then later on over time, there started to emerge recurrence of their cancer despite that same first therapy. And so down lower, you can see 
the detail of all the genetic mutations and alterations that were identified, whether it was a mutation or amplification, and their mutation allele frequency, each one of them, or their copy number. And so the advantage of this is that we can follow through time and see which ones have dropped, which ones have increased, for example, and therefore look at what new therapies might emerge over time. So this is the utility um, on the surface of a, of a blood-based circulating tumor DNA panel is that we can assess for baseline molecular aberrations and what to go after to target. And then also we can evaluate over time. And in, in this case, um, it's actually brought in each time what the previous results were so that you can see this all in one report. So in the previous um, tissue-based biomarker video, we talked about the difference between a prognostic biomarker and a predictive biomarker. A prognostic biomarker is one which helps to understand what the natural outcome of that cancer will be. Um, and uh, in contrast, a predictive biomarker is one that helps to predict or not um, benefit from a specific therapy. And we went through a number of tissue-based biomarkers. Similarly, from the blood now, we know very well that the correlation of what you see in the blood really matches what's going on in the tissue, if you see it in the blood, as I mentioned. And so HER2 gene amplification as identified from the blood, for example, is a positive predictive biomarker of benefit from anti-HER2 therapies. Similarly, um, as I'll show you in a moment, the amount of DNA in the blood at diagnosis, for example, it can be prognostic those patients who have a higher DNA concentration in the peripheral blood, that's circulating tumor DNA, have a worse prognosis, all else equal, compared to those who have low or not detectable circulating tumor DNA. Similarly, those patients that have a decline of more than 50%, for example, of their circulating tumor DNA allele frequency from before to after starting therapy have a better prognosis compared to those who don't. And so that's actually shown here, where we have one example of a patient who started therapy, their maximum allele frequency overall was 13.1% um, at baseline. And then after a few weeks of therapy, they had a complete reclearance of their circulating tumor DNA by the GARDEN360 test. And in contrast to the next patient, who had a really high burden of disease to begin with, of 76%, and it didn't really change much on therapy. So this patient had two negative prognostic biomarkers. One is that they had a higher amount of DNA and that it didn't decline after therapy. And so what we showed here was that patients who did have a more than 50% decline tend to have a better survival curve compared to those patients who did not have a decline. And so this can be a prognostic biomarker. You do a baseline draw and then a few weeks later, and if it's responding to therapy, um, then you can see that the, the therapy will be working. And so an advantage of this, and studies will be looking at this, is that because we tend to do CAT scans after two to three months of starting therapy, we could be getting a lot of therapy that's actually not working. And we could learn that much sooner by doing this circulating tumor DNA blood draw quickly after a few two to four weeks of therapy. And if it's not responding, then we might want to change to something else. Why give a therapy that's not working, that could be causing side effects and certainly is expensive, and we could change to something else and try something different. So um, this is not being routinely done at the moment in, in March of 2023, but studies are looking at this concept because it could be useful in, in the future. In addition to, to being a um, prognostic biomarker, this can be a predictive biomarker. So for example, this is a patient who had a baseline blood draw that showed EGFR amplification in the, in the blood at baseline, 40 copies uh, in, the, in the peripheral blood. And after starting therapy with chemotherapy plus an EGFR targeted therapy, the patient had a nice decline of their, their EGFR copy number eventually to zero. But then with serial blood draws every month, few months or so, there was emerging circulating tumor DNA in the blood that was no longer EGFR amplified. It remained at zero, the blue curve here, but that a different gene 
problem was emerging, KRAS gene amplification in this case, which was a resistance mechanism to the chemotherapy plus EGFR therapy. And so um, the advantage of using such blood draws can be for baseline biomarker assessment to help with predictive biomarkers that would benefit from a specific targeted therapy, including looking for intrapatient heterogeneity. So this will be the focus of the next video where different sites of cancer in the same patient can have different genetic changes. And so ctDNA represents all the different sites in the patient's body and so can pick up mutations that might only be in one location but not in another. And if you had a biopsy of one site, that may not represent other sites. So baseline genetic alterations, including accounting for intrapatient heterogeneity, can evaluate response to therapy if it's improving the amount of circulating tumor DNA in, in time. And certainly over time can evaluate for mechanisms of resistance that maybe could identify other genetic targets uh, over time as mechanisms of resistance and therapeutic options. So that's summarized here for the stage four setting on this slide. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because this is important to understand. So what we have here is on the y-axis up and down is the tumor burden, how much cancer a patient has, and also the level of circulating tumor DNA, the concentration. And so in the stage four setting, there will be a certain amount on average of circulating tumor DNA. And I mentioned that most patients will have identifiable circulating tumor DNA at newly diagnosed untreated stage four disease. Over time with therapy, we will see a decline usually in patients who are responding certainly of that circulating tumor DNA level. And then over time, as we get and generate resistance, where we'll talk about that in later videos, that the circulating tumor DNA levels will rise again to the point where there will be a decision that this therapy is no longer effective and we need to switch to another therapy. And so when that new therapy is added, the intention is to try and regain control. And often we do see another decline in circulating tumor DNA as the cancer is shrinking and being controlled by that second treatment option. Eventually, again, this may stop working and you'll see an increase again of the amount of circulating tumor DNA. So a few points to make then is that in this stage four setting is that just on the surface, that in addition to using serial tumor markers, which we talked about in the how do we diagnose cancer CEA and CA199, which will fluctuate similar to this with therapy. They will drop when therapy is working. They will rise as, as therapy is not working. CTDNA can certainly be used to do this, and it's more sensitive. Um, the tumor markers limit of detection will be higher than the limit of detection of a stage four assay like GARDEN360. So GARDEN360 will be able to see ctDNA positivity, even though the tumor markers are normal. I should note that what this figure doesn't show here is that occasionally, and very commonly actually, with therapy, you will see a drop in the ctDNA and tumor marker levels that go below their limit of detection. So it will look like there's no circulating tumor DNA. I showed an example where it went from 13% to non-detectable after therapy. That's not to say that the cancer is gone. It's just that it's not shedding anymore. It's being well controlled and you can't see it. It's below the limit of detection. Now, when we get to the perioperative setting and looking at the minimal residual disease assays, they have a limit of detection that's even higher sensitive. Their, their limit of detection is lower. But even in that setting, you will have situations where it's very common that you have a nice response and it goes below the level of detection of even the highest sensitivity assays that we have currently. That's not to say the cancer is gone. It's just that it's below its level of detection and that eventually over time, it will pop back up. It's something to be aware of. So the intention and utility of a circulating tumor DNA test in this stage four setting is to identify targetable genomic alterations at baseline. And as we'll talk about in the next video, to account for intrapatient heterogeneity, to monitor response to therapy over time, 
and to identify resistance mechanisms at each time point. And so again, the opportune time points to draw the blood, if your intention is to look for targetable genomic alterations, is at baseline diagnosis before therapy or at times of progression when the levels of the ctDNA are going to be at their highest peaks. On the other hand, monitoring can be done throughout to show the peaks and valleys and to see how therapy is working and to get a sense of, of earlier maybe when there might be progression occurring uh, compared to waiting till you see it on scans or certainly by symptoms. Examples again um, from various commercial companies are out there. Uh, I've shown you Garden360, but Foundation Medicine has one, Foundation Liquid, uh, that's complementary to, to the Foundation One tissue-based panel. Tempest um, also has one called XF, complementary to their tissue-based panel XT. Keras has one called Assure, complementary to their uh, My MySeq panel. And in addition to these stage four designed tests, as we get to the perioperative setting, the Signatera test from Natera can also be used as in the stage four setting as a monitoring tool. But something to be aware of is that this test doesn't give you the actual genetic alterations. It doesn't tell you if EGFR or HER2 or MET are amplified or if there's a mutation of interest. It just tells you the level of what the DNA is so you can see if treatment's working or not. So in my opinion, uh, in my practice, I prefer these panels that give you the, the level of the DNA, but also the genetic information with which we can use target therapy options. Um, you have to be aware that the Signatera panel, though, will have a, a lower um, limit of detection, and so it will be able to see ctDNA in those situations where it's not being seen by the stage four panel. A common question is, how much do these tests cost? Are they covered by insurance? And so in the stage four setting now, in 2023, now that these tests have been out there for a while, they've been extensively validated, many studies with them. Um, many of these tests like Garden360 and Foundation Liquid are actually FDA approved. And so in general, um, these tests are um, approved by insurance, including serial tests to look over time for mechanisms of resistance. So why would anyone want to do circulating tumor DNA next generation sequencing when you have a tissue biopsy already and you can just do the panel-based test? What are the differences in the risks and benefits, advantages and disadvantages of each? So an advantage of the circulating tumor DNA test is that it's a very fast turnaround time. Um, from blood draw to the result, it, it, on average, um, with say Garden uh, 360s, about one week, seven days. Um, and so, and occasionally can be less than that. And so, um, this is an advantage when we get to the tumor biopsy, is usually a, lo a lot longer to get that result. In addition, as I started this video out with, it is common to not have enough tissue in order to be able to do um, tumor-based next-generation sequencing. And so the so-called liquid biopsy, which is non-invasive, can be performed and compensate for that rather than trying to go back and getting another biopsy sample. In addition, as I mentioned, and we'll focus on the next video, it can assess for all sites of the disease simultaneously because all sites of the disease are dumping their DNA, shedding their DNA into the blood. And so you will get a, an idea of what's going on as a whole globally, as opposed to a pinpointed biopsy. And of course, over time, as the cancer develops resistance, a simple blood draw can assess for potential mechanisms of resistance and new potential therapies based on that, as opposed to going and trying to get another biopsy at every time that uh, a previous therapy stops working. Limitations or disadvantages are that at the moment, this is for only DNA and not for protein-based tests and certainly but not validated well for RNA tests, as opposed to tissue, where if you have a tissue biopsy, you can certainly do the tissue-based next-generation sequencing, but of course, then you can do protein-based tests like immunostochemistry for pdl one and for Clodin soon to be. So this is a disadvantage of these tests. They're only looking at DNA-based tests. In addition, a very important thing to understand, as I've been telling you in earlier slides, is that just because you don't see it in the peripheral blood 
doesn't mean that a specific mutation or genetic alteration of interest isn't truly in the cancer. It's just that you're not seeing it. It's not being shed into the peripheral blood. So it's the negative predictive value is not as high as we would like. There are false negatives due to this tumor shed issue. Um, another disadvantage is that it has a relatively smaller gene panel compared to tissue-based panels. And that's because, again, we're looking for needles in the haystack and I'm going to show you momentarily that the, the, the fewer numbers of ctDNA molecules in the peripheral blood, the more um, difficult it is to find them. And so you need to narrow down your search and really um, focus on fewer genes and sequence them at what's called higher depth. And I'll go into that in a minute. Um, for now, um, the, the reason is, is that you, you could do more genes on a panel and sequence them at higher depth. It's just extremely expensive. And so in the future, I have no doubt that as the cost of, the, of this and the technology improves, that we will be able to do more genes in the blood. But at the moment, the panels in the stage four setting are, are in the 70 to 75 gene range. And um, lastly, when we're talking about inherited problems, germline problems versus it's only in the tumor, the peripheral blood circulating tumor DNA assays that are currently available are not distinguishing between these two events. And so in the future, this could be done if you were to do a specific blood draw that would look at just the normal DNA from white blood cells and just the circulating tumor DNA um, then you could sort of parse out which ones are germline and which ones are not. But assays that are clinically available currently uh, do not have this capability. Disadvantages of the tumor-based next-generation sequencing are, again, that it has a longer turnaround time from the time that the sample is received at the place doing the sequencing. That doesn't um, take into account scheduling for the biopsy, which many of you have experienced can be days, weeks uh, before it can even be done. Um, then it has to go through the pathology department, um, through the processing of the tissue, as I showed you, just three to five days. And then uh, it has to get to the place that it's getting sequenced, which could have some delays. And so then the sequencing of itself is a little bit longer than the sequencing from the peripheral blood. So overall, you won't get a result from this for some time. And so that's a disadvantage. Um, again, there's you do need a certain amount of DNA to get a successful run for next generation sequencing from the tissue. And so especially in those sample types that have low viability of tumor, where there's quantity insufficient, or certainly if a previously sufficient block has been exhausted, you won't have enough DNA to do this. Um, and so you have to consider doing a repeat biopsy or not. Um, in some cases, the, the location of the cancer is not technically feasible, can't be accessible. And so, again, this is a, a, a disadvantage for doing tumor-based, um, tissue-based next-generation sequencing. And lastly, uh, along the lines of heterogeneity within the patient, again, the focus of the next video is that your biopsy represents that time point and that site that you biopsied only. And so other sites or other time points later on are not represented in that specific biopsy. And so this is a disadvantage of tumor-based testing. The advantages, of course, though, compensating this are that you can look at many more genes at a time whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, which are available at some commercial uh, entities, but certainly more um, uh, narrow oncopanels, but still larger than a, a ctDNA-based panel. Theoretically, although this is not done routinely by commercial assays, you could, even though that this takes so much time to get the result, you could do a tiered analysis. So you get the most important genes quickly and then get the rest of them later. And so that's a, a concept that um, is possible in, in the tumor-based um, testing. And in addition, as I mentioned, you have tissue available, so you can do other biomarkers that are necessary to be done on tissue by immunostochemistry. IHC, like PDL1 and Claudine 2.2. You could do RNA sequencing in some assays, like the Tempus XT tissue based next generation sequencing panel, does RNA sequencing 
in all of the cases ordered. Um, and something that I haven't mentioned is that RNA sequencing has a better sensitivity for finding one of those four genetic alterations that are possible called gene fusions or translocations or rearrangements. And so the RNA sequencing has a better sensitivity than DNA sequencing for these specific alterations. And so they are optimized to find fusions in genes that are of interest in this disease like FGFR and Claudin 18.2. And finally, um, tissue-based testing can determine and distinguish germline versus somatic, particularly um, if normal DNA is sequenced. And again, this is commercially available by the Tempus XT uh, assay, for example, where it's routinely um, done that the normal peripheral blood is sequenced and the tissue biopsy is sequenced, and then differences between the two can be assessed and germline events that are in the normal DNA can be identified. So what we see here is that there are disadvantages and advantages to both approaches. And that in my view, that they can be complementary to each other to get the full picture. And certainly in my practice, I do do this routinely because uh, again, the, they can compensate for each other's disadvantages. So moving then to the localized setting, where again, the amount of circulating tumor DNA is generally lower than in the stage four setting. So we need to have different assays. And again, when we're talking about biomarker semantics, prognostic versus predictive, this pertains to this uh, area as well, very importantly. So as an example, circulating tumor DNA positivity after a curative surgery and or after completion of the adjuvant treatment, the treatment given after the curative surgery, is a poor prognostic factor compared to having a circulating tumor DNA negative assay. And so in a later video, when we get to that, I will show you the evidence that that's the case, that if you still have circulating tumor DNA after your putative curative therapy, this is not a good thing. And, and it will predict likely recurrence over time. In contrast, a predictive biomarker in this setting would be the result directing the therapy in terms of what to do. And so I put them in parentheses because again, as we get to the later videos that show the evidence of this, there's not clear or definitive evidence in my opinion that these results should be used to dictate what we do around the time of treatment, but rather they do tell us the prognosis of what's going to happen. And so, for example, the idea though is that a circulating tumor DNA positive test after a curative surgery, for example, can predict what therapy to use. And if it's negative, what therapy, say for example, not to use because it, it's not useful. And so these are important hypotheses, but again, in my opinion, there's not enough evidence to act on this result in such a manner. So in contrast to the stage four setting where the levels of circulating tumor DNA at relatively high levels, in the perioperative setting, the levels are usually much lower. And so what we see here is that as we go through uh, the from left to right, early stage disease to the time that you're diagnosed with a stage one, two, or three tumor, to after surgery, to over time after surgery, the levels of the DNA can fluctuate. And so in this perioperative setting, we will learn that the standard therapy is to give two months of chemotherapy with flot chemotherapy before, and two months of therapy after. And the therapy before is called neoadjuvant therapy and the therapy after is called adjuvant therapy. And so what we see here is that there are potential utilities of looking at circulating tumor DNA in each of these. The first is monitoring the neoadjuvant therapy and tailoring potentially therapy in that setting. And I differentiate them into setting 1A or setting 1B, which is before you start or after you complete the neoadjuvant therapy, but before surgery. And so applications of this assay could be used in that situation. 
the next and probably the most important and the most sought after answers are in this second scenario, looking at MRD assessment or minimal residual disease assessment. And so this is after surgery and that you have two possibilities. One is right before you start adjuvant therapy and one is right after you complete adjuvant therapy, 2A scenario and 2B scenario. And so what you see here is that these would be called landmark analyses, meaning you do one blood draw and it's going to help represent what's going on at that time point. And you have potentially to make treatment decisions based on that result. And so there are a few situations or scenarios that could result in each of these 2A and 2A situations. The first is, is that after surgery, you still have circulating tumor DNA positive. This would not be good. This would tell us that there is still cancer somewhere despite us trying to remove it all. And so this would predict a likely recurrence. There's two other scenarios. One is that you have a circulating tumor DNA negativity and that it's truly gone. The cancer is no longer there and you're below the limit of detection, obviously, and it continues to be low forever. That means the cancer is cured. The last scenario though, is that it's negative postoperatively. It's below the limit of detection of your highest sensitivity assay out there, but it's still present. It's just not shedding enough DNA for your assay to detect it. But over time, this, at, this ctDNA will start to emerge and pop up above that limit of detection as the cancer is gives them time to grow and become enough burden to be able to be identified. And so the challenge in this scenario is differentiating between the latter two possibilities, ctDNA negative and truly no, no cancer there, or ctDNA negative and cancer there just below the radar. And so we already talked about the negative predictive value and the false negative rate of these assays. And this is an example of that, that really only time will tell. And so the suggestion that, well, if it's ctDNA negative, maybe we don't need adjuvant chemotherapy. I would, I've would i been very hesitant to say that until I see evidence that shows that withholding standard therapy, flat chemotherapy for two more months is really the right thing to do because that extra therapy may be what helps to cure this particular patient and to convert them to cured um, after completion of the chemotherapy. Similarly, in the 2B scenario, so after completion of the chemotherapy, one could have three possible outcomes. One is that you have obvious residual ctDNA positive disease, which would likely predict recurrence in, within the next few months to certainly within a year. Or you could have ctDNA negative, which is truly cured, or that is just below the radar and just as a matter of time before it starts to pop up over uh, the limit of detection of your acid. And so these are all very important principles to understand, particularly in this second scenario after surgery, either before adjuvant therapy or after adjuvant therapy, what the result of your ctDNA result means. And then there is a third scenario where the ctDNA in this particular setting can be used, and that is as a monitoring tool over time. And so um, that is looking for whether or not it continues to remain negative or if it pops up to being visible. And so I am showing you this because by the time you get a clinical recurrence, when a patient has symptoms of recurrence, you could identify that sooner by imaging and usually sooner than that with tumor markers and sooner than that with a stage four based assay like Garden360 and certainly way sooner than all of that with a high sensitivity MRD, minimal residual disease assay. The real question though, which remains unanswered in my opinion, is does finding it here earlier matter? Does it change the ultimate outcome? Can we do a therapy here that changes the actual course of what's going to happen over time? Or are we just finding what's going to happen earlier 
but the same thing is going to happen anyway. And so that's a critical question for this third scenario of using MRD-based testing. Then, of course, there is the situation of looking for screening patients, whether they're high-risk patients or just the general population for these cancers, with a, just a routine blood draw, which would be very nice to, to screen, the, screen for these cancers to find them earlier, because, of course, we know the earlier the stage when a patient's diagnosed, the better the outcomes. And so this is the least developed uh, at the moment, particularly for this cancer type. But in the future, this will be of interest. Again, common questions are, are these assays in this perioperative situation in any of these three scenarios approved or available? And what are their costs? And so in contrast to the stage four setting, the validation of these assays are much less to date. And um, there are no FDA approved assays for gastroesophageal cancer for this particular cancer type. However, there is an example from Natera, the Signatera test, which is approved for other cancer types like colorectal cancer, um, and therefore commercially available for any cancer, and certainly could be used in this situation, and, and it is used quite frequently um, in this situation, and we will go into that and the evidence that supports it or doesn't support it in these different three different scenarios in a future video when we get to the perioperative um, segments. So a few points about what is being looked for in these high sensitivity perioperative MRD, minimal residual disease assays. Of course, first we can be doing sequencing of the DNA for gene alterations. But in addition to that, we can leverage our understanding that there is something called methylation signatures that are tumor specific. We touched on methylation signatures in the videos um, on uh, mismatch repair and CDH1 early on, where methylation of promoter regions in front of a gene turn off the gene transcription and their methylated promoter regions and that this is usually common across the DNA, across genes in cancer cells. And the patterns and which genes are, are methylated are actually unique to different tumor types. And so this understanding, if we were able to sequence this and determine the signature of methylation, we can augment our understanding um, of what's going on in the peripheral blood and identify abnormalities and increase the sensitivity of the assay. And in addition to that, I mentioned earlier, this pieces, the size of the pieces of DNA, also known as fragmentomics, the circulating tumor-related DNA is shorter in length than normal DNA from the blood. And so these three components can be leveraged to identify really small amounts of circulating tumor-related DNA in the blood. The next thing to really understand, and I alluded to earlier, is that if you've chosen one or a very few genes to sequence, your limit of detection is really low. You get a really good depth of analysis. On the other hand, if you have a larger gene panel, 70 genes or whatever in your panel, you don't get as much depth of, of uh, analysis. And so your limit of detection is not as good. And that said, the advantage is you get to sequence more genes. And then on the other extreme, if you have a really large gene panel, then your depth of sequencing is generally less than the, than the others. But again, the advantage is you're sequencing for more genes. And so each of these can be applied to different situations and different goals. As I mentioned earlier, you could sequence to a higher depth of sequencing but this is at the moment really, really costly and so not routinely done. And so different assays have approached this problem and are designed in different situations. So with that said, the next thing to understand is that there are two different types of assays in development looking for MRD, and that is tumor-informed versus non-informed. 
So what does that mean? Tumor informed refers to you've done some molecular analysis, some sequencing of the DNA from a tumor biopsy or a surgical sample and sequenced it. And you've identified what genetic mutations are present. This is often done on a panel of some sort, whether it's a 15 gene panel or whether it's an intermediate panel or whether it's a large gene panel. Then you can choose of the mutations identified, which ones you're going to look for in the peripheral blood and the circulating tumor DNA. And the advantage now is that you know what mutations are present in the tumor. And so you don't need a broad panel because you're searching for what's there. You know what's there. And now you can sequence just those and get to really, really high depth of sequencing and a really low limit of detection. So you can find even just very few molecules. In contrast, the tumor non-informed doesn't go and do any sequencing on tumor biopsies or surgical samples, but rather leverages some of these other variables like methylation signatures. So an example is an assay that is looking at an oncopanel that's actually quite large. Um, and the advantage again is that you don't need to know what the tumor mutations are. You, you're covering the bases with a really large 400 or 500 gene panel. But in addition to that, you're sequencing for methylation signatures, which are usually very specific for a given tumor type. And so by adding these two variables together, you can increase the sensitivity and get down to limits of detection that are similar than the, to the other strategy. And a, a last variable that has to be taken into account in this particular approach is something called CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis, where in many normal samples from a normal patient that doesn't even have a known cancer can have what's called clonal hematopoiesis, where some of the white blood cells have mutations in genes. And so without taking this into account, you could have false positives with this strategy, as opposed to here, you know it's from the actual tumor. And so the mutations being searched for are really specific. And so this is a, an important component of a tumor non-informed assay is to remove that. And there are algorithms that use fragmentomics and other things to I I exclude normal white blood cell mutations and not include them as a tumor-related mutation. So that is the overview of the two types of assays and their background in terms to understand what's being looked at in this perioperative minimal residual disease space. So the next thing I want to spend some time on, and I'm looking at colon cancer, is because colon cancer um, has more validation and, and studies looking at using MRD-based circulating tumor DNA assays in this setting. And from this, we can learn some important principles and then apply that to the gastroesophageal cancers. And so this will be in a later video, but just as an overview, there are different assays being designed um, that are either tumor non-informed or tumor informed. And um, for example, a tumor non-informed assay was done as part of a randomized phase three sample set that was more than a thousand patients and looked at two specific genes and their methylation signatures that are colon cancer specific and, and provided results in terms of you looking at it as a prognostic biomarker and a predictive biomarker. In contrast, there was an assay uh, publication looking at Garden Health's assay specific for colon cancer for MRD called Garden Reveal with a few samples, only 70 samples. And again, this assay is looking at both methylation signatures and a 500 oncogene panel and using this together to increase sensitivity and then showing and looking at its utility as a prognostic and or predictive biomarker. In contrast, the tumor informed assays, one of which um, from an Australian group that was uh, eventually looked at in a randomized phase two study looking at CT guided therapy versus standard therapy. And this assay is looking just at mutations first in the tumor because it's tumor informed and the 15 genes used are a standard set panel used in every patient. And then of those 15 uh, genes assessed, if there was abnormal ones, 
then those would go back and look at in the circulating tumor DNA. And again, this was uh, assessing whether this assay could be used as a prognostic biomarker or a predictive biomarker. And then finally, there's this Signatera assay, which is looking at a 16 gene panel, but the 16 genes are identified first by doing next generation sequencing from a large oncogene panel in the tissue. And of the genes identified for that specific patient, personalized to that patient, 16 top mutations are chosen and then looked at in that patient. So it's different than this standard panel that's looked at of 15 genes in all patients versus 16 genes specific to the patient at, at hand. And so again, these are two informed assays that we're looking at whether or not this could be used as a prognostic and or predictive biomarker. And for the most part, these studies are, um, especially in these two commercial assays, are not from randomized studies, are observational cohorts, and therefore subject to a lot of uh, heterogeneity and bias. And so really, we can't get a full understanding, particularly of the predictive utility of these assays. But in contrast, at least we have data that is from relatively large samples, and in many cases, randomized studies. So to summarize, for the tumor informed for the Natera Signatera test, the test is being done on the tumor tissue with next generation sequencing first from a, a, a large oncogene panel. You choose the top 60 mutations that are identified in that patient, and that typically will take some time to get all of this testing result. And then to perform, say, for example, a landmark analysis right after surgery, you would get a blood draw about a month after surgery, or at the time, all chemotherapy is done in the scenario 2A and scenario 2B on the previous slide. And then you would do specific sequencing called digital droplet PCR testing of the top mutations, uh, 60 mutations identified. And that typically takes about a seven day turnaround time. And so overall, this can be time consuming to get a final result of whether or not there's DNA in the blood. In contrast, the commercially available garden reveal test uh, is not needing to know any baseline tumor genetics because it's just doing a blood draw. It's doing a large oncogene panel in the blood along with the colon cancer specific methylation signature assessment. And from this um, assay, one can do one landmark blood test around a month after surgery or after completing all the therapy, and it takes seven days to come back. And so that's an advantage of this particular assay. And so I point out the commercial assay that's tumor non-informed and the commercial assay that's tumor informed because these other assays are not um, readily available as a clinical test. Uh, they were done by academic centers. And so um, they're not validated to be done routinely in the clinic, as opposed to um, the garden test and the Natera test. So again, the reason why I'm pointing this out in colon cancer is to show you that there is a uh, starting to become a body of evidence to look at the two main questions. Can this be prognostic perioperatively and or can it be predictive of what we should do perioperatively in terms of therapy? And some of these cases being randomized phase three studies that are large. In contrast, when we look at gastroesophageal cancer, we have fewer studies and we have many fewer samples um, that we're talking about, 17, 68, 62, 20. And so the evidence to suggest or support its utility are much less. And so um, the first assay is an assay from a randomized phase three study, but it's a small subset of that study of only um, 20 patients that are looked at, for example, of that critical time point postoperatively, that situation uh, 2A MRD. Um, but the assay that was used in this study, again, was an academic center's assay looking at um, a tumor non-informed assay in the blood only of a 58 gene panel and not looking at methylation signatures. And so, um, you know, there are limitations in terms of these studies because they all have different approaches and they're hard to compare the results from one assay to the other. 
um, in another assay, which was not from any randomized study, it was an observational cohort of, of patients that happened to have available samples and outcome data perioperatively. And it was from a sequencing panel, again, just from the blood, a little bit of a larger panel, um, and uh, again, from a relatively small sample set. And then finally, there was Signatera data um, from two different studies, relatively small studies, not randomized, observational, and looking at the same assay, at least, compared to colon cancer with that same approach. And so again, the point here to set up for the perioperative video in terms of what evidence do we have to use these assays as a prognostic tool or as a predictive tool, uh, particularly to tell us how to treat patients are scant. So is this assay prognostic in the gastroesophageal setting? I will offer that from these data and from data from other tumor types is that it definitely is prognostic, that even though we have very few sample sets, that if you have circulating tumor DNA after surgery or after completion of adjuvant therapy that's identified, the positive predictive value is very high, meaning it's not a false positive for the most part, and that over time, the cancer will emerge and, and come to light. On the other hand, is this assay predictive of what we should actually do or not do at any of those time points, particularly in that section or situation 2A or 2B, is that I would say, no, we do not have evidence to support doing anything different than what would be considered standard um, based on the result, because we just don't have enough evidence to support doing that. So as a summary of what we've talked about here for circulating tumor DNA, we differentiated between utility in the stage four setting and assays designed for the stage four setting and their, their actual intentions versus assays designed in the perioperative setting and the different scenarios perioperatively. And at the moment, only one commercially available test to be used for gastroesophageal cancer um, in this particular setting. And we talked about the evidence or lack thereof of using these assays in each of those situations. We also talked about the basics of circulating tumor DNA and that the amount of DNA increases with the burden of disease and the stage of disease. And as such, different assays have been developed to be applied in each of these different scenarios. We also looked at some examples of how these assays can be used in the stage four setting and with a case example. And we also looked at how these assays could be assessed in the perioperative setting and the differences between a tumor-informed versus a tumor-non-informed approach. In the next video, we'll be looking at tissue biomarker testing and heterogeneity that is identified within a given patient at baseline diagnosis and certainly over time after therapy and how circulating tumor DNA can assess that and complement our understanding of what's going on in the cancer. So stay tuned for that. Thank you.